This is Keys to the Shop, episode 196, Understanding Consumer Preferences with Peter Giuliano. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I'm your host for the show, and I thank you so much for being here today. And also, thank you for voting for Keys to the Shop in the 11th annual Sprudgies. I didn't get the win this time around, but a huge congratulations to the guys over at Cat and Cloud, always doing an amazing job, as well as uh, Boss Barista as the honoree in that category. Uh, There's so many great places to go for information in specialty coffee right now, and I'm really honored that you uh, tune into this show. So thank you, and be sure to subscribe to the show too so you can stay up to date and share these episodes with a friend also. That would be hugely helpful. Get uh, Get these ideas out there. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers. And uh, what makes them so amazing is that they have a relentless focus on curating the best equipment from all over the world and then fitting it perfectly with the needs of their customers. If you're in a position where you need to buy equipment for your store, maybe you're getting ready to open a coffee shop for the first time or you're, you're on your way to opening your second store and need some guidance and you want to work with great people and get the right product for your situation, then Prima Coffee is the company that you want to be aligned with. And right now, if you go to this link over at prima-coffee.com slash keys, you can use the promo code HOLIDAY5 to get 5% off your order. Some restrictions apply. That's HOLIDAY5, this word HOLIDAY with a number 5 after it. When you go to prima-coffee.com slash keys, and this is for keys to the shop listeners, and it's such a great deal from our friends over at Prima Coffee, and it's going on until January 31st. Talk with Prima Coffee about getting you the right equipment for your needs. Again, that's prima-coffee.com slash keys. This episode is also brought to you by the fine folks over at Pacific Foods and the Barista Series line of plant-based performance beverages. These are designed specifically for professional baristas who want to give excellent plant-based options to their customers. They have high standards for what they serve, and Pacific knows this, so they not only made these for baristas, they made them with baristas, with a lot of feedback from the barista community around the world. That's why they perform so well on the bar, whether you're using coconut, rice, oat, almond, soy. It's going to produce really great texture for latte art, stand up to the heat from steaming, and keep the flavors focused on the coffee. So it's not going to be an overwhelming beverage. This is really important for your customers to love their beverage, no matter what milk options they have. And uh, Pacific is doing such an amazing job here. So I would encourage you to go to pacificfoods.com, follow the link in the show notes to find out more and get this in your store. Uh, Try it out with your staff and your customers, see how they like it. I really think you're going to love the way this performs on the bar. Uh, The Barista Series is amazing. Get it in your shop, pacificfoods.com. All right. Well, today we are honored to be able to speak with Peter Giuliano about consumer preferences, about uh, consumer trends in the research and what it means for your shop and how to respond to the research. And uh, Peter Giuliano has been in the coffee business for over 30 years, starting as a barista in San Diego. Uh, He worked in a variety of different jobs, roasting, cupping, uh, training, managing, I mean, you name it. He's done those jobs and shortly became involved with working at the uh, what was then the Specialty Coffee Association of America, becoming deeply involved in the training programs, serving as a training committee chair. He has been a volunteer for the Coffee Corps and other Coffee Quality Institute programs, uh, teaching cupping, roasting, and marketing programs. He was the founder of the Executive Council for the Roasters Guild and also served as its chair. Peter Giuliano was also the director of coffee and co-owner of Counterculture Coffee. And in 2012, stepped away from that and directed the Specialty Coffee Association Symposium, which is a fantastic series of lectures addressing global issues in specialty coffee. Uh, that you should definitely check out if you're going to the SEI Expo in Portland coming up in April. Right now, Peter not only does that, but he is the chief research officer for the Specialty Coffee Association, as well as the director of the Coffee Science Foundation. 
And today we get to hear from Peter about what the research has shown over the years. It's been about 10 years now since they've been collecting research on uh, retailers and um, consumer trends, and heavily in those two areas specifically. They collect a lot more data, as you can imagine, at the SCA. But the focus of our conversation today is to draw out some uh, points from the research into consumer preferences and trends, as well as some of of what he has seen from uh, research into the state of retail specialty coffee, and talk about what it means for your shop and and how you should respond to what uh, is found out about what kind of coffees customers prefer, um, how they're categorized in terms of those preferences, and, and why it matters to your shop. So, Uh, Peter is a longtime friend in specialty coffee. I've known him for quite a long time, and it's just such a pleasure to get to talk to him on the show. I hope you get a lot out of this, and certainly there's a lot to chew on here. So without further ado, here now is my conversation with Peter Giuliano. Well, Peter, it is such an honor to welcome you to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? Great. It's nice uh, talking to you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a long time since we've chatted. I've known you for so long, and uh, I'm so excited to see just how consistent I think you've been in your uh, pursuit of just knowledge in coffee. Not just knowledge, it's like this. you've had a science bent ever since I've known you, and you've always been great at presenting those things that you're so curious about and, and learning and teaching people about this. So your role now just seems like the the perfect place for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel that way. I've been, um, this is a funny little kid story, but when I was in fifth grade, I decided I, I loved science and, and, uh, and, you know, I, I used to do these crazy things because, uh, because that was my passion. And, you know, who knew that I ever would be involved in, in coffee science of all things. Um, uh, but uh, I, I feel so fortunate to be able to to work in with these two things that I love, which is science and knowledge building, and then also coffee and coffee shops and, and that whole culture. So um, it's I feel thank you for saying what you said, but I I too feel like I somehow landed in a place that just feels very perfect. <laughs> Um, well, tell us a little bit more about this. Uh, tell me, tell us a little bit about your role as the you're the executive director for the Coffee Science Foundation, and That's you're right. the chief research officer. That's so, right. tell us a little bit about that and what th- that part of the SCA does. Also, sure. So, um, uh, so the Specialty Coffee Association, which emerged from um, the histories of the Specialty Coffee Association of America and the Specialty Coffee Association of Europe both of whom had um, research traditions uh, as part of what they did. Um, uh, and that is for a trade association, like the Specialty Coffee Association, that it, it, is, it is part of what many tra- trade associations do, is do research that helps make, uh, helps benefit the industry. And um, uh, the Specialty Coffee Association has aspired to do this um, for a long time and has done little um, bits of research, but especially, mostly I would say market research, um, you know, estimating the size of the coffee market or the, trying to characterize what the specialty coffee market uh, looks like. Um, however, about five years ago, it became clear that there was much more academic interest in coffee than there had been previously. And that's mostly because of the sec- success of the industry and, and, I, I, and people like your listeners, you know, um, uh, you know, especially coffee, you know, during our careers, Chris, we've seen a radical transformation in the ubiquity and, and, um, and, you know, uh, availability of, of specialty coffee. And that has influenced the academic research world too, they noticed um, and started to drive a lot more um, more coffee research uh, in universities, research institutions, academic environments. So what we did was about 
five years ago, we, I started to work on building a bridge between the academic coffee research community at mostly at universities and the industry. People like you, your listeners, me, um, the coffee community. Um, and so one of the things, the tools that we used to, um, to help build that bridge is this thing called the Coffee Science Foundation, which is a, it's a, it's a charity, it's a nonprofit, um, 501c3 nonprofit established by the Specialty Coffee Association to do expressly this, to use coffee research, coffee knowledge, to um, build a bridge between the academic community and then also to make um, specialty coffee better, to improve livelihoods in specialty coffee, um, and to improve quality and, and, and fundamentally to use this kind of knowledge to make coffee better. So, um, so we, we started this initiative about four years ago. Um, last year, uh, in 2019, we formally launched the uh, Coffee Science Foundation, and we're now running a number of research projects um, at universities all over the world um, designed to research some of the questions that we have as a, as a community, um, and, and especially coffee. So my job is to um, help build those bridges, help connect the coffee community with, with coffee science, um, help connect coffee researchers, scientists, um, uh, economists, sociologists, et cetera, with the coffee community so that they're structuring their investigations in a way that's meaningful. So I, I feel like a matchmaker most of the time, <laughs> um, like just making connections and, and, uh, and, and then I get to be an advocate for this, this work. When you're uh, matchmaking, as it were, you're trying to um, give people a direction about what to study I imagine right. there's, there's such a broad spectrum of things that you could study, and, and we're going to sure. be diving into some consumer study uh -huh. uh, in this conversation. But of course, this is it's more than that. It's the like you said, science of the like the plant itself is huge. The sustainability of coffee agriculturally, it's a lot of what you're you're in charge of as well. Mm -hmm. And that direction seems like it, without somebody in that position, everyone would be working on their own. Uh, projects of their own curiosity, which is great, but not necessarily building momentum toward an end. So yeah, it does. Is that and, sound about right? Yeah. And one, one thing that I've noticed over the years, and, and it's because, you know, um, so I, as you know, I come from the coffee trade. I, I, I began as a barista 30 years ago and, and, um, and, you know, came up as a shop manager and a uh, roasting company owner and manager and, and stuff. So I come from the trade. And one thing I know about the, especially coffee trade is we are made up of entrepreneurs and, um, and innovators and people that figure things out, you know? Uh, and that's one of the beautiful things about specialty coffee. We're, we're dreamers. We're the kind of people that, you know, just want to build a, a company based on, excellent quality coffee and community. Um, and that's, and we find a way to do that in our town or whatever. Um, and oftentimes a lot of people in our community get interested in trying to prove stuff. And so we'll start to do little experiments to try to understand, um, uh, things about flavor and what leads to flavor and sort of build these little experiments in our backyard, so to speak, or our kitchens or our coffee shops. And the thing is though, um, and I say this for myself, I was one of these people who set up these experiments and, and they don't work very well. And the reason is, is because we're not, we're generally not trained in how to do this kind of work. Um, and it's hard to set up an experiment and understand what, you learn from that experience, uh, that experiment in a meaningful way. And that's why they have, you know, uh, becoming a scientist through the system takes so long is because you have to learn about, uh, what bias, how bias can affect, um, what you're trying to learn and, and how to understand statistics and, and, you know, false positives and, 
and all of these things that can interfere with your understanding of kind of scientific investigation. So that's on the, that's on the community side. On the, on the academic side, these people are trained as scientists or economists or whatever, but they, they lack practical knowledge about how to, and often they don't know how to get to a hypothesis. And by that, I mean, you know, a, a, a food scientist studying at a, at a university may never know that it's, it's really important to us, you know, how long, how coffee changes flavor when you're holding it in a, in a, in a thermally insulated carafe after you've brewed it, you know, that's a really critical question for a, um, a shop owner to know. Um, but a, that may never occur to a, to a, a food scientist. Um, so they, the, the scientists have the skills, the coffee community has the hypothesis building and the, and the, and the practical knowledge and bringing those two things together is when you get really powerful um, activity um, and, and really good insight. And so that's what we're doing now that hasn't happened so much in the past um, is, is really emphasizing um, that work. And, and, and what that looks like practically is, is companies um, coming from the coffee community, committing some resources, that is money, and helping that get to the research institutions, supporting grad students, professors to do research in their labs that's really relevant to what our community needs and then taking that information and disseminating it back to the coffee community. That's huge. In, yeah. yeah I, I, re I remember, and it still goes on, there's a lot of uh, crack scientists in the in, in any industry, I suppose, just trying things out, but to you know bring in professionals who are trained in recognizing those biases and everything else is really, it's great because so much of the market depends on accurate information. If you're going to steer the market one way, it better be backed by something that's not just your hunch yeah. uh, and a wild, a wild trend. And especially the way we're connected now in uh, 2020, you know, uh, things can take off inadvertently and either do a lot of good or, you know, do some damage. And so exactly. taking it seriously is critical. Particularly when there's livelihoods at stake, yeah. you know, um, so, you know, it, as everyone knows, you know, the um, many, many coffee producers live on a knife edge, you know, and um, I was one of those coffee buyers who would go down and give advice to a coffee producer about how they might improve their coffee um, so that it could be sold at a higher price or something. Um, it's really critical that if, if a coffee buyer is giving that sort of advice, it better be built on something solid and mm. not a hunch or a, or a intuition or a bias study or something like that. Um, at the same time, another livelihood that's at stake is the, the small business owner, you know, they're having to make this, they better be making decisions that are based on, on good information, because if they're not, they could be putting their business at risk. So, so I've become over the years much more, um, I don't know, committed to, to, to the idea that we better be able to prove what we claim. Um, because as I say, these lives are, um, livelihoods are at risk. Yeah. Sustainability and all, yeah. all parts of the value stream is so critical. And, yeah. you know, for, for us at keys to the shop, you know, obviously it's a shop. We focus on that, uh, primarily and, we do have that influence over what happens upstream from us. You know, if we're successful and we have demands that we put on roasters and in, then importers, et cetera. Um, and we base a lot of our decisions on uh, either trends or what we see the market doing in any information that we can get our hands on, which is actually not that much. When you're an owner, your head is buried in a ton of different, you know, pieces of minutia just to keep the shop open. And so, being able to poke your head above water and, you know, or use a periscope and, and figure out where you are, is you want to know that that one effort that you're going to uh, undertake is going to be worth it to your business. And so when we're talking about the research that you do for consumers, you know, learning about the, the trends in the industry and what consumers' preferences are, et cetera, I wonder how that data is collected um, and... And then I guess the second part of that question is, 
once that data is collected, how, how has it, what has it shown over the years and what has been the most surprising and the most recent results of it? Sure. Um, okay. So, uh, we've got, um, one of the most sort of robust areas of research that we do is exactly what you're talking about, which is in the consumer space, but then also, you know, you mentioned the keys to the shop and the shop being important. We also collect do research and collect information on what the businesses, of especially coffee, look like, you know? And I'll sort of start by saying, so uh, a couple of years ago, we did a, what we call a benchmarking study, which is we, we uh, asked a lot of uh, uh, everybody in our community, all the, all the businesses in our community to essentially share their P&Ls with us um, anonymously um, and through a website and they could share all of their financial information with us and we could collect that anonymize it and um and then and sort of you know uh, crunch the numbers and show what the norms are for especially coffee businesses and what we saw is probably something that's very obvious to you and your listeners which is you know many of these coffee especially coffee companies are very small um you know two or three employees uh and are you know dependent on their their shop their you know often one shop um is a very normal kind of business and they're faced with challenges of of staying solvent as a business and i i can look at these numbers and see as a former business owner myself i can see wow this is a this is a challenging business to run and operate and make sustainable so um uh so a lot of what we do is aimed at trying to get good information to that sort of person um, who's running that kind of business. One of the things that we've done is what you're, you're asking about, which is uh, consumer research. We started doing, let's see, almost 10 years ago now, we started to do um, consumer research. Uh, a lot of that was led by a person named Tracy Ging, who was working for the Specialty Coffee Association at the time and had a real interest in in um, understanding understanding consumer behavior and consumer perceptions when it came to specialty coffee. And so ever since then, we've had this evolving consumer research. I'll, I'll share with you a couple of the interesting things um, and then a couple of surprises, uh, recent surprises too. The, one of the first insights that we have had is that, is that the specialty coffee consumers fit into two kind of psychographics. Um, and we could very clearly categorize um, the, the consumers that we were talking to. And we talked to them through focus groups and also these kind of blogging projects that we asked them to do where they talked about their coffee behavior and what, what they cared about in coffee all over the country. And these two categories we called specialty adopters and super specialty. And um, the specialty adopters are the people who are have have come to specialty coffee um, in their life. They 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 see specialty coffee as a as a way to treat themselves to something good. Um, they often drink specialty coffee every day, but they see it as a treat and as an indulgence. Um, and their their goal is to is to satisfy some thing that they need, um, warm drink, a, a boost, a caffeine boost, a, a, a treat um, during the day. That's what an adopter um, does. Adopters tend to like chain kind of coffee stores or kind of comfortable um, coffee shops in their community. Okay, so that's the adopter. The super specialty is the person who wants to know more about coffee, wants to be, is on the journey to becoming a con connoisseur. They're the people that are curious about, you know, different preparations or different roasts or more information about coffee or learning more about coffee. So that for them, it's a connoisseurship journey rather than a self, self caring thing. So that's, that's the super specialty M mindset or psychographic. Now the same person can be, can be a, you know, and often is a uh, an adopter in the morning. You know, their first cup they want to be comforting and soothing, and maybe later in the day they're more interested in learning more about coffee. But 
once you start to understand that these are two distinct sort of consumer categories, you can, you can see that, okay, different things that we do appeal to these different consumers in different ways. The adopter does not want in, to be lectured about an information about the origin of coffee or what altitude it was grown at, or, <laughs> you know, wh what differentiates, you know, washed process from honey process or anything like that. However, that message, those exact things might appeal a lot to a, to an, a, to a super specialty person. So um, just understanding that distinction, um, developing some tools to recognize um, these consumers where they're at, building your business to either focus on one consumer category or the other, or finding ways to appeal to both um, is really interesting. So we've got a few um, reports and kind of lectures online that, that, that explore these, uh, these types. And, and then we've also, my colleague, Heather Ward, Heather Ward is, uh, uh, she's our director of market research. She, um, she's got an MBA and a long-term love of coffee. And she, she's really applied her, a lot of her intellect to, to, understanding these consumer dynamics and then putting them into helping people put them into practice. So that's one of the key insights that we've taken away from our, our, uh, our, our consumer research. Here's another little detail, which is the super specialty consumer has a higher price tolerance than the adopter <laughs> does. Unsurprising, right? right it figures. Um, yeah. Um, little details like that we've, we've, we've learned that, that, uh, that, that can help people, you know, but uh, the, the super specialty um, people only represent about 20% of the specialty coffee consumers. Hmm. So, so they're a smaller number, they pay more money. Um, but you should know that if you're going to build a business based on, on appealing to a, a super specialty. It, it might be a little early because I know that that particular uh, piece of research was something I, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think you said it was just, kind of emerged as a trend in you know, what you found in your studies. Um, but I wonder about mobility within those categories, like are you know, the 20% going to be growing? It, did it grow from a, lar a smaller portion? Or was it 10% and then, you know, people who were the on the uh, average, you know, the, the ones who were not super specialty, did they move into that sp super specialty category? Like how much mobility would there be? potentially within those categories? It, it, it's a good question. We have seen over the time period that since we've sort of come up with that construct, there's been some, some changes, um, uh, particularly the emergence of the millennial kind of demographic is, as, as a powerful consumer group. And what's interesting is um, I think those proportions, that sort of 80-20 proportion, I think are, is pretty... Um, pretty solid, but the characterizations are, are, are different or the specific behaviors are different. So now an adopter, whereas, you know, they might've been 10 years ago, um, really focused on say a, a flavored latte or, or something like that now are drinking cold drinks often in the afternoon. Mm. Um, and, uh, so moving from a, a sweet milk-based drink in the morning, a sweet hot milk-based drink in the morning to a cold, sweet milk-based drink in the afternoon. Um, and seeing those kinds of shifts rather than, than, than shifts in the market composition. When, when we've started to see the relationship, look into the relationship between the adopters and the supers, um, what we see is more that individual people go back and forth between these categories often depending on their psychological space. You know, there are very few people who are just dyed in the wool supers or, or, you know, or adopters that never want to be a super. So th that flexibility exists, but I think that th those proportions seem to be pretty, pretty stable. That's a, that's kind of a revelation in that the mobility or that having that dual personality, the dualism of the coffee consumer, I guess, um, is something that we almost don't 
think is true, because when I hear that, when we hear that, I think we want to make people dyed in the wool adopters or super specialty. Like you either get it or you don't get it. Um, and it, from what you're saying, it just sounds like, no, you know, the, the people who would sign up for a pour over class at your coffee bar might also just want a cold brew with vanilla at some point during the same week. And you'd be wrong to think that they were uninformed about coffee, but in that moment, they don't want to be informed necessarily. Right. And I think, you know, I agree with you that that's not a intuitive sort of thing in our community, you know, that we think is true. But it's true even for people that work in coffee, you know? I mean, yeah. I was a traveling coffee buyer for a long time. And so I'd be sitting around, you know, a breakfast table with, you know, people who had worked 10, 20 years as coffee connoisseurs. This is their life. They're, you know, and oftentimes for the first cup of coffee in the morning, people do not care about it at all, other than it's warm, satisfying their need at the moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and that's true for me, you know, I, I don't want to be lectured about my first cup of coffee in the morning. Um, I consume it at home, usually by myself before my kids are awake. And it's just, a, it's pure enjoyment for me. It's not an intellectual exercise at all. Whereas later in the day, when I'm here in the office surrounded by coffee people, I'm inter more, much more interested in experimentation, trying something that I've never tried before, you know, trying that, you know, coffee that somebody brought from, Taiwan that's interesting, you know, um, which mm -hmm. is more of the, that super kind of kind of thing. So Here, Here's a question that's a little maybe tangential, but you know, I, I want to hear what the surprising results are too here. But um, I was just thinking as, as we're talking about this, that um, when we're talking about sustainability of coffee and we're talking about demand that ge is generated from a consumer to the coffee shop and up the stream of value. Um, I wonder if it's, you know, something that we should embrace more. And I see we are, we are embracing it more that 80%, the adopter mentality seems to be driving a lot of our adopting, uh, adopting more developed coffees, more, um, coffees that don't necessarily have to be 90 plus to right. you know, open right. up the gates to let more people in seems like it's a more sustainable uh, framework instead of trying to get people to constantly be in that super category. Yep. I think that that's definitely true. And I, I think that's true. Okay. There's very few, if any coffee farms that only produce, you know, super high, you know, coffees that will get a 90 plus, you know, um, every farm produces a diversity of, of coffees from their farm. Um, depending on the time of year that they're harvested, various altitudes on the farm, whatever. So, um, so we need these this diversity of cult, uh, of consumers as an as an industry. Um, I, it would be I don't think it would be a healthy industry if we only had supers. Um, you know, we 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 need this uh, uh, variety of coffee consumers because we've got a variety of coffee producers, and we've got a variety of coffees that come from those coffee producers. So diversity is good. And, and that includes people that are not interested to, at this moment in a 90 plus, mm -hmm. you know, light roasted pour over, um, and are interested in a sweet, hot milk-based drink. You sell more of those and that, you know, ro you roast more coffee to provide for that categories of so the light roasted, uh, the uh, more fussy coffees, so to speak, you, you here in that super category, you're not, it, it, this might be wrong, but maybe, I mean, you tell me you're buying less coffee in that category because you're not. Yeah, like, potentially. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so I think, I think what's clear to me is that both need each other, both, both these groups need each other and deserve respect for what their, what their needs are. And it's our job as an industry to find ways, good ways to, um, to meet their desires and their needs, um, while building sustainable businesses for ourselves and our, our partners. Hmm. So, um, yeah. So, um, what we've been doing recently more, so all of the, the f basic research that we started almost a decade ago now was based on talking to consumers about their coffee choices. Um, what we've been more doing recently 
is, especially with our partnership at UC Davis, is doing more consumer work, more consumer sensory work. So actually tasting coffees, describing them from a sensory descriptive, a, a sensory science perspective, and then presenting those same coffees to consumers and seeing how they, how they react to them. And that's where some of the surprises to me have come in. Um, uh, and I, I've, I said the word before, but I'll say it again because it's, it's so important, is how diverse um, consumers are. Consumers really do like different things and they're consistent in, in liking different things. So I, I think most of your, um, your listeners might be familiar with the golden cup ratio or the, or the brewing control chart that we, we use. Sure. You think uh, so? uh, uh, may, uh, probably, but maybe yeah, is okay. there a like cursory overview just. Yeah, this is, um, this is the idea that there is a sort of a golden, um, uh, place where, you know, coffee of a certain strength, um, and a certain extraction percentage that is how much, how much extracted, how much you've extracted the coffee. There's sort of a golden mean that if you get within that box, most people like that coffee. We call that the golden cup. And actually it was called the golden cup, um, when this concept was first invented in the 1950s. Um, and it was based on the assumption that, you know, if you, if you make coffee a certain strength and a certain way that 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 will appeal to the most people. So we we started to test that with consumers, um, preparing coffee in multiple multiple different ways, multiple different roast levels, different grinds, different extraction levels, et cetera, just hundreds and hundreds of different treatments and showing those to um, consumers and then doing it in a systematic way where we're giving them the same coffee in, you know, over, over a weekend, we'll give the same coffee to a consumer multiple times so we know we're getting good data. Um, and, and so if you, from the consumer, one of the consumer studies that we did, which, which was 118, um, consumers, um, and these are daily coffee drinkers who drink, who drink black coffee, because we were doing this with black coffee. So these had to be daily coffee drinkers who drank black coffee, drip filter coffee. So if you put them all together, you, um, Sure enough, their preferences clustered around that that golden cup place, just as we predicted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's interesting. But you can take another step, which is start to cluster the people. In other words, to take the people who liked what they each liked and, and develop clusters. And what we discovered was you could break the people down into three clusters. There was one cluster that really liked strong coffee. Like their preferences were way out of the box to the strong side, right? They're, they like coffee stronger than we thought, they, that people liked it. There was another group of, this, uh, of consumers that liked coffee significantly weaker than we thought they liked it, right? They were outside of the box to the, to the, um, to the weaker side. There was a third um, group of consumers that liked coffee also weaker, but also they seemed to not like coffee that much. They, their, their, their enjoyment scores were never very high. Mm -hmm. Now, when you average the, the preferences of all those people together, you get the box. But then you realize that that box that's in the center of our preference, right? Uh, the preference that we assume that people like is actually an average of many very diverse people. Whereas you would actually satisfy pe people a lot more in a coffee shop where you might have, you know, a really strong, intense coffee for the strong, intense coffee lovers and a light, weaker coffee for the weak coffee lovers. Rather than having one coffee that appeal that we think is going to satisfy both of those people, it really is sort of the middle ground that doesn't, potentially it's the middle ground that doesn't satisfy those, those two. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so people's preferences, uh, they, they have very strong taste preferences within the category that we might just um, apply too broadly to what we serve. Right, right. And, and, and consumers are diverse and heterogeneous in what they like. And they're very consistent in their preferences. So, and that's what we've seen when we've do, done, doing the, and it's just super consistent, that people 
like what they like and they consistently like what they like, but everybody's different. You can collect people into, into their preferences. It's not that every individual is a unique special snowflake. There isn't going to be a single kind of coffee or a string, single strength of coffee or a single roast of coffee or a single whatever that's going to appeal to everybody. People are different because of course they are, <laughs> you know, co coffee, we would be surprised. It would be surprising if we found some food that everybody liked, you know, exactly equally. I guess McDonald's French fries are sort of like that, but, but, <laughs> but, but uh, everywhere else there's people have a variety of preferences. And, and so what our research shows is those preferences exist and we can understand them. All of this, I think, is something that coffee shops are responding to in the way that they offer drip coffee in how we've seen, like, in ancient days, it was the clover when it first came out, like customizable mm -hmm. coffee for the preference of your customer. And then, um, you know, most coffee shops uh, eventually get around to having two types of coffees on bar, you know, the, on their batch brew of, you know, a variety to offer to their customers is as sustainable as that may or not may or may not be, I don't know, but uh, in terms of coffee waste. Um, but I do see that the the market is responding to these kinds of preferences that you're talking about being proved out through the, your research. When you say people like what they like, you know, I, I agree. I think people have these complex preferences based on all their experiences. The question I think is how much of their experience is informed by what they're told they should like subconsciously. I don't know, can't really test that necessarily, but mm -hmm. have, was that something that factored in at all to this where you think, well, how, how have we created these preferences over the years so that now when we're getting this person walking in the door to our study, one right. of the 118 people, right, right, right. we know that they have been ingesting marketing from specialty coffee for X number of years, and maybe if you had got them 10 years earlier, they would have had a different preference. Like how much of that is at play here? Yeah, it, that's a great question. That's something that we're actually talking about really currently. Um, there's been some work about uh, in, in coffee and um, what, are, what are called in the psychological literature mindfulness exercises. So these are, you know, where people are encouraged to drink um, coffee in this case or eat food. Um, uh, you know, where they're thoughtful about what it is and how it tastes and rather than doing it sort of distractedly while you're driving to work or something, um, being conscious about it. And that does change their preferences and change their, their, their behavior. Um, I'll mention one other thing, which is that in our consumer research, one thing that we've noticed is that um, the number one way that consumers, particularly those adopters that we were talking about, um, get their coffee preferences from is friends. Um, so not from anything from the coffee shop, but from somebody they know and trust who's making recommendations. So I think, um, I think we, it is possible. My intuition, we haven't done a lot of research on, on this exact thing, but, but my intuition says that, that it is possible to influence um, consumer preference uh, but you have to build trust first and, um, and you build trust by, by satisfying what they sort of want in the original, from the original place, you know? And, um, I had a friend who ran a restaurant in San Diego and I, I really liked the way that he thought about, um, engaging with consumers, which he always thought of, of it as a negotiation, you know, he, he gave them what they wanted, but then occasionally he'd ask for them to try something a little bit different as a favor, you know, almost. And then that's how he wanted, he tried to work with um, changing consumer preference. I think, I think the consumers are, what they're not is super subject to like whimsical variations in they're consistent in liking what they like that can change over time, but, but uh, they can be respected for their consistency of, uh, of preference. Well, I'm thankful for their consistency. Uh, yeah. That really helps secure uh, a market so that we can build momentum around that consistency. That uh, 
when we're talking about retailers reacting to this study, so we would purchase the study or, or read the study and have um, a decision to make as an owner what to do about these adopters and supers, what to do about this spread of preferences within the golden you know, cup area of the chart. You know, How do we respond to the research in a way that's not just um, jumping to a conclusion just because the, the data says something, we're going to change the way our business is, is structured yeah. to accommodate that. Uh, I, I guess a, maybe a good way to ask this would be, when is it evident that we should uh, we should heed the data from research, and uh, when we do so, that it would be sort of a, a sustainable move for us? Uh, how do we take action on this information? Yeah, I think probably the best, and I think when we talk about the way we hope that people use this information that we we get out there, I don't I don't think anybody should take it and say, oh yeah, I've got to change my business because it says. This says, you know, this says people like, um, uh, you know, that, you know, 30% of people like dark roast. So that means I've got to, I've got to make sure that I'm selling 30% dark roast something, you know? Um, but what I think it can do is it can present, uh, opportunities for, for, um, engagement, you know, it, with your, with your customer base. So you can say, maybe you never thought of it, you know, in terms of the adopters, what I like, so on this adopters supers thing, I think if I were a, a, a shop owner, I might start to look and see if I could see those categories within my, mm -hmm. within my consumer base. And if I could, I might sort of experiment with the way that I talk to one group or, or control my marketing. So as I, I guess what I'm saying is you could use it as a basis for experimentation and then going with what works in your own environment rather than trying to have it be prescriptive. Um, and uh, because, you know, everybody's, you know, situation is unique and, you know, running a shop in a, in a, uh, in a university town where your, your customers are mostly, you know, millennials or younger is going to be different than if you're running a, a, a shop in a, in a, in the first floor of a financial services building in an urban area, you know? Right. So, um, so it's always going to be situational, but we hope that our information at least causes people to maybe think a different way about their business. Well, I love that you're emphasizing the idea of, you know, just paying attention to your local surroundings. It was one of the questions I had is that I think we have a tendency, maybe we do this with cafe design and, uh, where we see other people doing something, we think, well, that's what we should do because it's being done in a broad broad sense. So mm -hmm. if the data shows that there's a, a global trend of people wanting this, then I, for the sake of the success of my business, I should do it. If, if you do too much of that, you're not going to be sensitive to the needs of your local community. And some of this seems like it's a coffee personality test like an enneagram almost like we're <laughs> we're creating a category to think of your customers in which is helpful but you, uh, some part of me thinks you know you can take those things and say yes this helps us work together well but it's not a substitute for a relationship exactly exactly and and the other thing i think is really really important and this has come up for us over and over is, and then this was also my experience before when I was selling wholesale coffee is, is, you know, paying attention to your, what you hear your customers saying to you, and then also paying attention to what they're doing and maybe not saying, you know, so, you know, the, um, what we've noticed and what I've noticed is that, is that a shop owner who pours over their their reports at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, drink trends, you know, what coffee drinks are being purchased at what time of day, you know, those sorts of geeky sort of quantitative things. You can learn a lot from those things, you know? Yeah. And, and sometimes I've noticed that the shop owners might think, well, wait, I need to, I need to organize my business around what I see as the trends in the marketplace. 
and ignore what's the trend in their store, you know? Right. And we, we live in this amazing era. We've worked a lot with, uh, with Square, who has uh, provided a lot of information from their, from their terminals, you know? They, they, we get all that information and, and sort of um, gather together, create some averages, and so we can see how prices for coffee vary around the country, for example. National level, what, or at the state level, what drinks are more popular at what time of day, et cetera, et cetera. We can see those macro things. But I know what I know about that, that piece of equipment is that's available on the micro scale as well, that information. And inside that, you know, and there's all these tools that we have now that didn't exist when you and I started. Um, and people can get really valuable, powerful insights into, into their, what their consumers want that shop to be like. Um, and that's the kind of information that's good as gold, I think, in, in adapting your, your coffee shop to, to the environment that it's in. You may relate to this a bit. Um, I certainly feel this way. Um, when you know your coffee really well, you can sense when there's not enough in the porta filter and you can sense when the shot's done and all of those things. If you're using mm -hmm. the same coffee over and over again, it's just a, a, a intuition that you have. And if you've been, been in coffee long enough, I think, you know, you can develop that skill. You know, technology helps reinforce the consistency of these things, but you also can develop a sense of that coffee's personality, so to speak. And it seems similar to what you're saying that we've got these tools that we've never had before, we can use that in concert with being mindful of our own businesses. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to put it. So in the studies, I, I know we're talking about trends that we see consumers, you know, have certain preferences and um, yeah, some of it's very neutral. And I wonder from your perspective, personally, when you look at the data, what kind of things are you really encouraged by? When you look at this, uh, the results of your research, and what kind of things are you a little bit worried about, um, specifically when it comes to coffee shops and consumer research? Yeah, so um, mostly, mostly, I'm, I'm extremely positive about about things. I mean, so from the macro perspective, coffee especially coffee consumption, higher quality cons coffee consumption continues to grow. Um, it's been, you know, gaining market share for the last 20 years, at least. Um, people know the language of, 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 uh, of specialty coffee more and more and are increasingly interested in it. So that's all really apparent in our sort of market um, research. The other thing that I've noticed that this is not, this is more just observing the, the, the marketplace more, and we don't have any quantitative information on this, but I think, I think you'll agree. And, and I think it's pretty well established that we're also much more diverse in, in the way, especially coffee looks to people and is uh, presented to people. So I'm here in, in Southern California where um, in the Los Angeles area, where there's, there is this whole kind of um, Latin American specialty coffee movement that's happening, you know, entire chains of coffee that just really serve the Latin American coffee community, coffee drinking community, horchata latte is on the menu, you know, um, uh, you know, Mexican chocolate mocha is on the menu. You know, this is a very unique and characteristic kind of coffee at the same time you know um asian style coffee shops korean coffee shops are also thriving so there is much more diversity in in what specialty coffee is it's not just the classic italian espresso cappuccino cafe latte menu anymore it's mm. it's much more diverse than that and that's so healthy it means that that coffee is alive when that's happening you know when it's being changed and and um adapted for specific communities that's just a really healthy thing and then at the global level too this is happening you know um so you know we were the 
the way that coffee is exploding in places like Indonesia and Mexico City and, and uh, you know, Rwanda, these are places that have vibrant consuming, especially coffee consuming cultures now that didn't used to exist. And that's also very healthy for our industry as a whole. So those are th that's the good news. I think on the consuming side, you know, it's all kind of good news. The, 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 <laughs> especially coffee continues to grow. The health news is very good. Um, younger demographics seem to love coffee even more than their parents' generations. So, um, so lots of good, good stuff there. The, the worrying um, stuff is that um, it, we're challenged on the, particularly on the specialty coffee side with a coffee production um, system that doesn't work for a lot of coffee farmers. And if it, it can only not work for so long um, and then you, you start, you'll start to see, you know, it being much more difficult to get Panamanian coffee or Costa Rican coffee or, or, you know, a really cool black currant kind of coffee from, from Kenya or something like that. Um, so that's, those are the, the, I think the, the good news is on really on the consumption size and the challenges are on the production side. Hmm. Plus, you know, the reality of climate change and, and what that's doing for coffee um, and the diseases that are out there. Now, we're very fortunate that, that our industry is, is taking steps to address those things. Um, but that's where, that's where the challenges are. Right. And uh, I, I really am encouraged to hear um, the, the positive news about coffee's growth and its diversity and it, you know talking about the challenges on the farm level and the production of coffee it just makes me feel like yeah this is all the more reason why we as uh, retailers have such a, a high amount of uh, responsibility there's a lot on the shoulders of retailers to yeah. represent and be successful as businesses and pay attention and be mindful and and mind this data as well. Yeah. That said, I, I will say, um, and this isn't a caveat, but it's it's something, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, you know, when I look at the 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 research that we've done with with coffee companies and how they're structured financially and stuff, I can see that it can be really, really challenging to run the coffee business. You know, real estate is really expensive. Um uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, uh I I I I would look at a you know, I, it, it's challenging to be able to pay the kind of leases that are being expected nowadays and build a sustainable business on top of that. Um, and also what we saw is how many, and we know that this is true, how many very small coffee businesses there are out there. Um, and when you've got a, a company that's being run by two or three people, it's really hard to take a break, you know, um, you know, how do you take a vacation when you've got two or three people running the entire business? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and those, those challenges are hard. I know that those are really hard for people. How do I grow my business? Do I even want to grow my business? Um, some, you know, we're hearing from a lot of people that they want, you know, they want to start a coffee business, but they only, they want to, you know, sort of cap it at one shop. Well, that's pretty challenging to do, to make a, to make a living off of one shop. Um, uh, given the numbers that I'm seeing. Um, so uh, that's a, that, I think that's a real challenge too, that, that sort of independence, um, that the independent shop thing, it's, it's hard to run that kind of shop in the, in the economy that we have right now. So um, there are some, uh, obviously, that are really successful at, out there doing that, but there are some that are challenged. And I'm, I'm concerned about the number of, of shops that I see that are in that sort of situation. Well, that said, you know, the kind of research that you all are doing to help address a lot of these issues, uh, retail and consumer research and um, the agricultural side of coffee, it, just talking about this now makes me more thankful than ever for the work that you all are doing. And um, I'm especially thankful that I was able to talk with you today on the show and learn a little bit more about, you know, what's going on out there. And this has been really 
informative. So I, I really appreciate your time. Um, where can people go to find more information about the research, uh, purchase some studies and uh, watch some videos and get even more in in depth and geeky with this kind of stuff? Yeah, great. Um, a lot of our publications wind up on um, the SCA news site. So if you look at, uh, I think it's um, sca.coffee slash news. Um, uh, you can see a lot of articles and stuff that are research outputs. Um, we have, we maintain on the sca.coffee website, a research portal that um, uh, we make some of our research free to everybody. Some of our research is, is, uh, is, is free to members only. Um, and you can get in there that way. And, and uh, there's a lot of things there. We do webinars and, and things on our YouTube channel. So um, the SCA has a YouTube channel. And then there's also another thing called Rico Symposium that we do that covers a lot of this territory as well. So lots of resources. I'm always talking about this stuff on Twitter and stuff. If anyone ever wants to follow me on Twitter. So those are all good places to go. Thank you so much, Peter. We'll link to those in the show notes. And uh, again, uh, thank you for being here on the show and for what you do. Anytime. Thank you for, for doing uh, this show. I think it's a real asset to the coffee community. So, And you've always been yourself a real advocate for uh, the coffee community and coffee people. So thank you too, Chris. Well, there's so much to think about in the last part of this conversation and throughout the whole thing, just figuring out how to respond to this information. And I love the idea, uh, two things. I love the idea of first we are casting a wider net when it comes to our consumers and making coffee more approachable. And that's, it seems to be what customers want as the same person can be in that specialty adopter and super specialty uh, category. It's evident that creating a menu and an atmosphere and a business that can welcome both is a pretty wise thing to do. On top of that, the admonition uh, to go out and understand your local market and not necessarily react super quickly to um, large scale research or on on you know even national research on coffee preferences, but always trying to narrow it down to what your customers want is prudent as well. So much to think about uh, from this conversation with Peter. And I just want to say again, thank you to Peter Giuliano for being a guest on the show and sharing his wisdom and the research and really helping us uh, gain some insights to make our businesses better. You know, like Peter said, it's you know not easy running a coffee business, especially now and uh, work like what is being done at the SCA currently under uh, Peter's leadership is so, so critical. So thank you very much, Peter. Now, if you want more information about what was discussed here in this conversation, you can go to uh, sca.coffee. That's the SCA's website, and you can go under the research tab to find out more information. Um, you can also go to news and sign up for their newsletters, uh, 25 Magazine, and things like that. There's a lot of resources here. So sca.coffee, a perfect place to go and uh, dive deeper into this content. Now, if you want the transcript from this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com on the contact page, uh, fill out your information, click the sign me up for the newsletter box, and you'll be signed up to uh, get the newsletter delivered to you on a weekly basis. And that's basically the transcripts and some bonus resource material that I'll send to you. Uh, and that's really handy to have around as an extra um, copy of the content of each episode as it comes out. And also that bonus material can link to things like videos that have presentations on topics relevant to what we've discussed that week, or just things that I think are really interesting that'll help you in your career or business. So uh, again, go to keys to the shop.com on the uh, contact page, fill out all that information and you'll be set to go. Of course, if you want to email me, if you have questions, comments, or feedback for me about the show or interested in working with keys to the shop consulting to help you and your business, you can either go to the contact page and reach out to me or just email me directly, chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. 
So that is a wrap. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you got a lot out of this conversation with Peter uh, and that it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, you know diving into the research and getting to know your customers better and having a really solid business to welcome more people into your coffee shop. Uh, thank you, and I hope that you have an awesome day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>